Jared Casti from RBC Capital Markets is, is with us. And Jared, we heard there his take on uh, the bank's capital position. And later in the interview, also a very clear commitment uh, to the dividend, to increasing it, no need to cut it, and, and to capital returns, which I guess is probably music to investors' ears. Yes, it is, Wilfred. Um, when you look at Morgan Stanley, they're very well capitalized, as James pointed out. Uh, not only Morgan Stanley, of course, but the entire banking industry, which he alluded to as following the financial crisis with the Dodd-Frank legislation, the capital for the industry has grown dramatically. But specifically in Morgan Stanley, he has been committed, and you saw the big dividend increase last year, to give back the excess capital. They've used it, you know, for organic growth, of course. That's number one. They've also used it for acquisitions. But then they're going to anything after that. We'll give it back to shareholders in both dividend increases and share repurchases, in our view. I, I'm interested on your take on what he said there about bank regulation. He said it went from 40 to 100, and it's only come back to 92. Unsurprising to say uh, to hear him say it's only a, an 8 percent decrease. What, what would you say it's been decreased by? And, and of course, the, the, the key follow-up question is: It doesn't really matter what you or I or, or James thinks. It matters what the new Fed appointees think. <laughs> You're so right, Wilfred. Um, it's what they think. And they obviously take uh, some pressure from uh, Congress, particularly from the Senate Banking Committee. Um, but I'm, I'm in his camp, in James' camp, that, you know, the banking regulation, just think about the amount of capital that the industry has now relative to the pre-financial crisis period. When you look at the tangible common equity, equity ratios or t um, the CET1 ratios, as they refer to, common equity tier one, they are almost double, in most cases are double, what they were pre-financial crisis. The regulations, the stress tests, which actually have turned out to be a very good um, policy, we think, to de-risk the bank's balance sheets. So, yes, they've dialed it back somewhat, particularly for the smaller banks, Wilfred. Uh, that's, you, know, you might remember they said that the Global, um, the GCP banks were banks as small as 50 billion in assets. They have since ch changed that, of course. So the systemically important bank numbers, uh, the asset sizes have gone up, and that's been one of the changes. But I think that's a proper relief for the smaller banks. But I'm with him. Whether it's eight or 10 percent less, that it's hard to say. But it is less, but it's not significantly less. Jared, what do you think about Gorman's comments about the Fed, the speed at which they should be moving, or does it really not matter as long as it's well telegraphed and fairly transparent to market participants? Uh, Courtney, I, I think he's right. I, I'm with him. I think the Fed has actually uh, been slow to move. Um, they've obviously uh, have changed. We're going to hear more about that this week. We all know about that. But, you know, we haven't seen levels of inflation like this. In, in decades. And this is different. And so as a result, they may have to move faster than any of us are anticipating. And when you take a look at the economic growth, not just here in the U.S., but globally, and you look at the stimulus that's still in the system, it's pretty amazing. The liquidity, you know, the banking industry's liquidity is unprecedented right now. You look at the amount of money that the banks have sitting up at the Fed in reserves, it's very, very high, well above normal. So we would say that the Fed is behind the, uh, in tightening. They are going to need to tighten, uh, especially if it proves out that this inflation stays well above 2 percent by the end of 2022. They will have to tighten and to try to rein things in. 